My name is Jan and I race online. I've tried various platforms, but I quickly found sailonline.org to be the best. Um, great camaraderie, essentially free, great weather simulations, loads of races and loads of boat polars. IRL, that's a sail online speak for in real life. I'm a boat owner myself and I was a keen dinghy and then a keelboat racer pretty much up until I took up online racing. Uh, purely coincidental. Um, so, you want to register for sailonline.org? Well, on the home page, top left, click on register new account, enter your email address and hit send, etc., etc. Um, you'll receive an email with a line which reads, to continue registration, please follow this link and click on that whole line. A screen comes up asking you to enter a username and a password and then to verify the password. Um, now, um, your username will in fact be your boat name, so choose it carefully. Also, please note blanks and special characters are not accepted and that your user slash boat name is case sensitive. Read the password. Unless you're terribly worried about pirates, choose something simple and easy to remember. Again, it's case sensitive and no special characters allowed. When you verify it, you have no way of seeing what you chose. So another good reason to keep it simple. Once you have registered, click on either go to race or new HTML5 client under one of the races in the right hand column. Um, the go to race uh, button will take you to the original flash interface and the new HTML5 button will take you to a new HTML5 uh, client. That client uh, interface is still in development, but it's uh, working uh, very well and it already has more functionality than the flash client. Um, and the flash client is about to be uh, dropped by uh, various browsers. Um, so you have difficulty next year using that. So best to go straight away and get used to HTML5. Unfortunately, however, the rest of this presentation is about the flash client, but there isn't really that much difference. Okay, uh, now you're, you're, you're looking at your registration and it says um, that you're going to represent Afghanistan. If you leave that stand, that's who you'll be racing for for the rest of the days unless you request uh, special um, help from the administration to change it. So please uh, change it straight away if you don't want to race for Afghanistan. Uh, just scroll down and you'll find the nation of your choice. Then choose your boat and then click register and race and you are in. Okay, so you're looking at a chart of the race area. Your boat is sitting on the starting line. Well, it's a starting mark. And in the top header ribbon, it tells you when the start is and how many miles to go. Click on the chart and drag to move the chart about so you get to different areas. And then on the left, you also see five buttons, hot buttons. I'll tell you about the top three first. If you click on the plus, you zoom in a little. And if you alt click on it, you max zoom in. Click on the minus, you zoom out. Alt click, you max zoom out. And then the little boat icon below those two, click on that and the page centers on your boat. Now, um, not only can you change what you're looking at in the latitudinal and longitudinal dimension uh, by click dragging on the chart, as I just explained, uh, but you can also change what you are looking at in the temporal dimension, in time, by clicking on the little triangular knob on the weather slider above your instruments at the bottom of your screen and then dragging it. 
release it and um, circled in the presentation slide, uh, you will see what day and time of day you are now looking at. And that's in UTC, which of course is an English-French compromise acronym, once known as GMT, Greenwich Mean Time. Now, also, the first time you look at the instruments, uh, they won't look quite like the ones in this presentation. There'll be a few less readouts. Alt-click anywhere on those readouts for a different selection. Uh, I think there are four, so keep clicking till you find a layout and a selection that you like. Uh, personally, I, I like to have one that tells me VMC at least, uh, velocity made good on course, uh, to see if I'm going fast in generally the right direction. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing quite like going fast in the wrong direction for sinking down the pan. So. That's my, <laughs> my recommendation. Go fast. So go fast, but in the right direction. Uh, and another aid to checking that direction is the so-called predictor line. I'll talk more about that line later. But for now, let's just set it up and check out some other options. To the right of your screen, you'll see a column topped with five little tabs, a steering wheel, a clock, a podium, a speech bubble, and a question mark. Click on the question mark, and you'll get a subscreen headed helpful links, with below said links, a quick help button, and an options button. Obviously, <laughs> The sale online manual should be helpful, but like all manuals, it is weighty. There's nothing like RTFM, though, where the M stands for manual. The other helpfulish links I'll leave you to explore yourselves. So uh, click on the options to get a dialog box headed options. If you leave the weather notify sound checked, your computer will blow you the sound of a storm every time there is a weather update. So that's every six hours. It's quite useful. If you check 24 hours, the default on your screen is shown uh, as the weather 24 hours ahead. Uh, that's not so useful. If you move the ticks on the two sliders, the isochrones, that's uh, the contours of equal TWS, true wind strength, and the direction arrows become more, become more or they become less. And then if you don't like the arrows, but you would prefer barbs, check the barbs box right underneath them. Above that is the checkbox that I really wanted to mention. Enable both predictors. Make sure that is checked. And as I said, we'll talk about what, what that is later. Below the barbs box is a checkbox for great circle mode. Um, and there is no reason that I can think of to not always have that checked on. And lastly, you may well have a preference for either decimal degrees or degrees and minutes when you are looking at your screen and moving the cursor about. There are a couple more options I haven't dealt with. That's because I don't know what they do, and I'm guessing they're not important. Now tick the tab with the little steering wheel. This takes you to the command center. Mission Control, where you can either type in a course over the ground, COG, or a constant angle to the wind, TWA, that you will then sail. Hit set boat course and you're off in a new direction. Fill in a decimal amount of hours and check the checkbox just in front of it and your command 
will be executed that amount of time after you hit set bolt cores. For example, if you enter 0 0.01, your command will execute in 36 seconds time. Be careful, if you haven't got the checkbox checked, and you have a time filled in, and you hit send, or set boat course, it'll happen straight away. A mistake lots of people make lots of times. Of course, there's also a small delay in your message getting to the server, so that's added on to, for example, that those 36 seconds. So typically, you might be looking at 40 seconds after you've hit and if you've set 0.01. Apparently, uh, there are also some specific formats that allow you to enter stuff in days, hours, and minutes. Uh, but I've never used it because uh, I like to keep my mental arithmetic faculties <laughs> exercised. If you're interested, RTFM. Okay, so if you've entered a delayed command, a DC in uh, Sol parlance, or several, you can check them out by clicking the tab with the clock. That takes you to the DC editor where all your pending DCs are listed sequentially. Click on anyone and hit the no entry road sign and it's deleted. Or hit the edit button and that gets you up a little editing dialogue window. Make your changes there, uh, but make sure to maintain the formatting uh, that is in it, otherwise it won't work, and then hit submit and your change is made. Alternatively, hit cancel and the dialog window disappears, but your DC remains unchanged, hasn't been cancelled. Just the dialog window has been cancelled. Finally, uh, the listing of DCs can be behind in, in updating. Uh, so if you think it's lagging, hit the circular arrows icon, the, the little green arrows, to refresh the list uh, and to just check. Okay, next slide. Right, now I want to deal with the other two hot buttons. These two help you steer the boat and to decide and to set your course. Let's look at the little steering wheel first. That's the fourth one down. It's the same icon the Commander tab has, you'll notice. And its use is interlinked with the Commander. Hit it. And if you haven't got the Commander tab visible, this hitting action opens that up. Now move your mouse pointer over the screen which, uh, as you may have noticed already, then changes into two crosshairs. With top and right of page, the exact position of the crossed hairs indicated in either decimal degrees or degrees slash minutes, depending on the option you selected. Uh, but also, you'll see a red line comes up, indicating a possible course. The numbers for the course are shown in the commander. The commander also shows what that TWA for that course looks like on the polar diagram below it, and hence roughly how fast you can expect to go on that course. If you're happy with the course, click the end of the red course line on the screen, and the course is set in the commander. Now select whether you want either COG or TWA in the usual way and any delay you, um, you're thinking of and then hit set boat course. Done. Okay, and then the fifth and the last hot button um, is a drawing tool and it's indicated by an icon with a pair of dividers. Very elegant, I always think. Um, click it and click on the map to start a line. Then 
move the cursor or the crosshairs, whatever you call them, to somewhere else on the chart and click again. You've drafted a line segment. Move the cursor some more to somewhere else, click again, and you've drafted a second line segment, and so on. And then on the last time, double click, and that stops your drafting. And then you'll see each segment is marked up with a distance and a heading. And the distance and the heading will be either GC for great circle or RH for rum line. And again, that will depend on the option that you selected. To remove the drafted lines, hit the dividers again and then double click somewhere. If you just click once, your old penciled in lines will also disappear, but they're going to be replaced by a new line as soon as you click somewhere else on the screen again. I trust that's clear and we'll go on to the next slide. Racing area bounds and barbecues. <laughs> A barbecue is sol parlance for running around, running around, running aground. <laughs> and you can run aground on a coast as well as on a boundary. We might as well go into some detail on this one. The sol server advances you in finite time steps. If you haven't set a change of course for a while, in other words, for a for more than for less than 20 for more than 20 minutes then that step is 30 seconds otherwise it's every 10 seconds as you approach a boundary or a coastline the server checks ahead of your next advance whether that advance will take you across the boundary i.e. onto land or off the edge of the known world if it will it parks you where you were and puts you head to wind. Time to get the dinghy out, row ashore and have an impromptu barbecue. Alternatively, if you simply enter a course, that course, a course that will take you away from land, you'll be sailing again, although initially only at 80%, which depending on how fast you're going, will then either quickly or frustratingly slowly recover to 100%. Frustratingly slow can be nearly half an hour if you're doing, say, 30 knots on a beam reach. Okay, well, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but as I have mentioned performance loss, every time you change your course versus a command you briefly lose some performance. If it's a tack or a jibe, the faster your exit speed, the worse the loss. The rule is one-fifth the exit speed as a percentage. Once you've lost more than 7%, you can't lose any more performance. Every now and then, this becomes a hot topic among the SALT community, so there is plenty of reading on it on the forum. Click on Forum on the home page if you're interested. And as said already, the faster you're going, the longer it takes to get back up to speed. Enough. Okay, um, so say you have set a course and your boat is underway. Ahead of you, you will see two lines punctuated with regular dots. If you haven't selected both predictors under Options, you'll only see one. The one you will see then will be where you will end up in six hours' time on either constant TWA or constant COG, depending on whether TWA or COG has been checked slash selected in your commander. If you've selected both predictors, you will see two lines. One will be straight and one will be curved, sometimes only slightly. The straight one is the constant COG predictor, the curvy one the constant TWA predictor. One line is bold magenta, one is faint. The bold line is of the mode you have selected in the commander, so could be either COG or TWA. Finally, 
the dots on both lines work as follow. The larger circled transparent dots are hourly intervals, the smaller black dots quarterly intervals. Now, you may also see a yellow dot somewhere along both predictor lines. That will be because you have a time delay figure typed into the box for that in the commander. And the dot is that amount of time ahead of your current position. I personally always try to make sure I have 0 0.017 typed into that box so that the dot is just one minute ahead. Any less than that and the dot is simply on top of my boat. So that is the resolution, one minute rounded down. So the predictor lines are a guide, but you can't rely on them to set DCs for rock scraping, cornering about more, about which more uh, next. The other thing you can't rely on when approaching a coast or a mark in the sea is a zoomed out map. Let's talk about marks in the sea first. Center your view as best you can on the mark you are approaching and alt-click the plus icon. If your mark disappears, zoom out a bit till you see it and center your page on it again and zoom in again. At full zoom, the mark becomes a blob, a red blob during the day and a yellow blob at night. Uh, this is a nice feature of the flash client. The screen background goes black and your competitors disappear to be replaced by nav lights. HTML5 has eschewed, eschewed this effect as the majority prefer to be able to see their competitors. Others, on the other hand, would prefer they could not be seen at all. They think that's unfair and not IRL, not in real life. Anyway, right in the center of the zoomed in blob is a single pixel. That's the mark. Aim to go around the right side of that and you will be all right. Aim to go exactly through it and you'll probably go the wrong side. If you're wondering, just check the message at the mark. If it doesn't say round it and you've wronged it, even if the tracing track behind you looks like you got round okay. If you don't believe it, check your DTF, your distance to finish, in the ribbon, top of page, or under the podium tab. Once it's gone up by 0 0.1 nautical miles, you'll have sailed 185 meters the wrong way and lost 390 meters on the fleet. So don't wait too long. If you wronged it, go back. So zoom in. And then you'll also find that an innocuous looking coastline also has all sorts of capes and bays and rocks and islets that don't show zoomed out at all. In fact, you'll discover that those little islets, slees, SLIs, as seasoned solars call them, sneaky little islets, can be lurking anywhere, even in the middle of an ocean. So every once in a while, zoom in. Some of those slees are so thin that if you are lucky, you will just jump over them. You'll have done a slee jump. Just to explain, as the race engine only checks where you will land before it advances you, if that is going to be water, it will advance you, even if it jumps over a reef. A little anomaly, I suppose. And abusing it is frowned upon. It's a bit like hitting a mark and not doing your turns, IRL. Except, of course, there isn't the risk of a protest if you've been spotted. To round things off, let's look at the polars and how to understand them. So this is the Daler 46. Radiating out from the center left are spokes of increasing wind angle. Vertically up is TWA zero. So that's directly into the wind. 
further down is TWA 180. So that is dead square. The spokes are calibrated in increasing BS. And the wavy colored curves are the speed you will achieve in a certain steady true wind strength. Surprise, surprise. Straight vertically upwind, BS is zero. Funnily enough, we, we actually have a polar where that is not the case. Uh, she's a Viking longship, the Draken, where if the wind is light, you can row. Great fun. Sorry, I digress. Um, so, okay, straight upwind, you cannot go. Um, so how far should you bear off to get upwind as quickly as possible? Draw an imaginary horizontal line that touches a wavy curve tangentially and estimate the TWA that the tangent touches the curve at. For example, for the Daler 46 in six knots of TWS, that looks like about 47 degrees, the optimum angle. Similarly, downwind in 20 knots, you can soak as deep as circa 175, almost dead downwind. But in other wind strengths, of course, you can see that is no use at all. Let's look at another one. This is the XP55, Denmark's X Yachts current flagship. She points a bit better than the Daler 46 in six knots and is really quite extraordinarily close winded in 30 knots of 4.7. 40 degrees. Must be in flat water. Uh, inshore in the Baltic. Like the Daler, downwind, uh, it's 75 again in 20 knots. Finally, as mentioned, those lines of constant TWS are wavy, and wherever you see them dip, there could be what Sollers call a hopping opportunity. A hop is like a sail change, IRL. E.g., you drop the asymmetric and you luff up, or you bear off and hoist the kite. And in between those angles, there is a course that is not fast. Watch for those opportunities and guess, gauge what your optimum hopping angles are. They won't be top of the crests, but typically about 20% down from them. Either side, for example, of about 120 for the XP55 when the wind gets up to 25. And for the Daler, if you check, check back, that same dip is at about 110 TWA. Next, the Sunfast 3300, about 48 TWA upwind in 3 knots, about 165 TWA downwind in 20 knots, and hoppable either side of, again, about 110 in 25 knots. Now, the true sopper, seat of the panzer, seat of the pants soloer, will just eyeball the polar and pick a TWA. And if he's experienced, he will sail low and fast into a header and then tack before it starts to lift again, Steve Benjamin style. And ditto downwind, hot and fast and jibe before it starts to head again. The predictor line will help him judge it. For the more math mathematically inclined, there is always the cosine rule and a spreadsheet. I did this for myself years ago. I even worked out all the hopping angles at every TWS in increments of 0.1 knots and over the years for every boat. I'm sure others have done similar and may even have written little Python or Java scripts to do it more elegantly than in a sledgehammer sheet. Okay, however, if you're not into DIY spreadsheets or coding, there are two tools that are external to the game that provide you with optimum angle info as well. One is called WX Inspector. 
which alas runs in a flash environment so right now is doomed but part of it but separate is the optimum angles tool all created by a gauge a young australian solar who passed away too soon some years ago the other tool i'll mention now is called cropiers also created by a young solar a dutchman on this occasion you can find links to all of these and other tools via the links tab in the ribbon on the home page so one more polar and then i'll be gone the italia yachts 14.98 a very racy machine examples of the angles to be aware of are as shown and i won't go through them this time just read them off however by now you might be wondering why those lines of constant tws are quite so smooth well yeah that's not as in real life but it's because they reflect the best sale choices at all times no silly buying of auto sale changers paid hands in other words on salt and no buying of extra sales and because all the points in between the given points in a polar data set are interpolated um, the whole thing is dead smooth linear bipolar if you must know <laughs> have fun